figure out how I can see this green and not get feedback. Oh. <laughs> so. Over here, walk around or something like that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, I have a really bad habit that uh, most everybody hates, including my, my son keeps on telling me I'm, I'm crazy. But I, I write very detailed slides. <laughs> Too much to read. So the good news is, don't even think about it. Okay, they're just there to impress you that there's lots of stuff there, right? Sort of like a screen of code or something like that. Uh, uh, but I, I write them with a purpose and I refuse to go to the beautiful color picture one word slides that have found favor at so many conferences. Uh, I like to show practical detail and facts from real systems to back up my assertions. Okay, and these detailed slides do it. If you have to read them afterwards to absorb them, fine. But the message is, this is real, this is real life, this is as detailed as a page of code. Okay? And that's the way it is. Okay? Imagine holding a programming lecture with nothing but color pictures. Difficult, right? I, I can't do it. So forgive me, uh, close your eyes, listen in, forget it. But if nothing else, the uh, uh, slides give me a, a reminder of what I'm supposed to say in which sequence and stuff like that. For, oh, can we adjust that projector again, if possible? Again, everything, I have a lot of stuff at the very top, so it's nice to have. Now, if you really insist on incredibly simple-minded things, you know, uh, no pictures, color pictures, or really simple slides, uh, the TEDx organization forced me to do it, whether I liked it or not. And they said, please don't talk as you do to your geek friends. You're talking to a little old lady who's a dance professor. You know, so keep it simple. So if, if that's your level, little old lady dance professor, then go get the uh, slides there. Okay. Now, I hate to admit it, but I am an old programmer. Okay, I started plugging my first plug boards, because that was the original programming language, 1958. Okay, I started working my first electronic computers and building my own systems in an ev uh, evolutionary, or we would call it agile way today, 20 steps, 1960. Nobody taught me this was agile, it just seemed like a good thing to do a little bit at a time and make sure it worked. Okay. But uh, I have to admit, programming was fun. It's almost as fun as an older hobby I had called amateur radio. That was really fun, okay? But then I got a new hobby called, you know, computers and all that. So it was really amazing to get paid for it, the, all the fun you have playing for it, playing with, right? But uh, I admit, after 20 years and a number of programming languages, uh, I wasn't that thrilled with it anymore. You know, I knew I could tell a computer what to do, so what is there after that? Uh, what if you can tell an organization or a system how to use it in intelligent ways? Uh, that, so, somehow that seemed like the next level of challenge. So I'm, this talk will suggest that there is a next level of going from programming to software engineering. Right? And some of you, only need a few of you, okay? Everybody doesn't have to give up programming. I know you love it and it's comforting and keeps you in your comfort zone and it's fun. Uh, so please continue. We need great crafts people programming for sure. It's a very complex business. But we need something to organize what we do so we don't waste the great craftsmen doing totally failed projects where nobody looks at your code, okay? And so it's this higher level of making sure that great programmers not only write great programs, but somebody uses them in fruitful ways. That's the subject of the talk. And I hope some of you will uh, use your base skills of understanding programming to move to that next level, which I will call software engineering. Okay. Um, that's actually me at about six years old on Malibu Beach, along with the film stars. And uh, that's my first girlfriend, actually that's my sister, Wendy. <laughs> and I wasn't really programming quite that early, but we weren't far off from it. Um, okay, here's the whole talk. I, what is that, that means like something. Oh, it means nine minutes after snooze starting the talk. <laughs> I got, the next alarm will be at five minutes to two. Yeah, right. And that'll tell me to begin to shut up. And two o'clock, I'll shut up because you've had enough, no matter what I have to say. And you can read the rest of the slides if you need to. Okay, 
So, um, the first thing I observed is I've observed a lot of IT architects, principally in large banks in London, to give you one place where I look. And I was kind of disturbed by the fact that they um, never seemed to have clear requirements for anything. They were happy with extremely robust and very user friendly inputs. Hello, okay. And they were very happy outputting something like it's going to be modularized and we're going to use Windows GUI. Okay? And I found that garbage in, garbage out, and I didn't understand anybody had a powerful position of dictating what the bank would spend on their projects with that kind of stuff. I, I couldn't see it was satisfying any clear need, and uh, I couldn't see that the architecture would be interpreted as intended by the architects anyway, because it was so vague. So I got kind of disgusted with the architects, and I uh, was addressing about 300 of them in London uh, last fall. Why is this going in and out, in and out? Oh, to out of range. Where's where's the sender? More over there. Okay, thanks very much. We'll try that for a while then. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I, I address them, and, and uh, you, if you want to get the video, or for that matter, the slides, you'll find it there. But basically, I tell them off for being very immature, not even understanding what a clear architectural requirement is or caring, and not even understanding what a clear architectural specification is or caring. And just sort of, to put it very politely, uh, they are architectural poets with nice sounding words floating in and out, but certainly not doing any kind of engineering for serious systems. I have less polite words, I call them, but I was advised to take them out of the <laughs> manuscript. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> but I do have a paper called uh, fighting management bullshit. To give you a hint, it's what I called the architects. <laughs> now, um, the, the, uh, the basic idea of the talk is that the best designers of both the working process is not the manager or technical director, it's the developers themselves. I'm going to prove that. The best designer of the product is actually the developers themselves, not the architect. Okay, very interesting thesis. You may not have heard that before. But we, we can, I will prove it with case studies and examples of doing that. And if you believe that you ought to be empowered to design your own working environment, you ought to actually be designing the product yourself, not let the customers and architects do it, then you'll know how to go about it. You'll, 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 you'll get uh, specific methods for doing it. That's the talk in a nutshell, okay? Uh, this is just me telling the, the pompous architects that they haven't got a clue as to what they're doing and ought to be ashamed. To. I'll give you an example. I ask one question. When you specify an architecture, do you specify any information about the estimated cost? <laughs> you think that, you know, some of these things cost a billion pounds and ten million pounds, these architecture ideas, right? Three people out of 300 put up their hands. Uh, couldn't care what it costs. Who cares? I just say a nice sounding poetic idea and bank may spend 10 million or 100 million pounds. Who cares? Okay, that's like, are you got to be kidding? Okay? And then I asked the second question, you know, you're designing architecture for a reason like better security or better user friendliness or better maintainability. Uh, do you specify how much of these things you're going to get with your architecture? You've got enough security, enough user friendliness. How many people do that? They put a number on how good they are. One person out of 300 architects put up their hands. I said, you've got to be kidding. This is poetry. This is art. This must be fun. No responsibility, no ethics, and you get paid a lot of money. And your managers are dumb enough to pay you for doing it. I can't believe what I'm looking at. <laughs> By the way, at the end of the talk, you'll find me realizing that these guys are not at fault. They're just a victim of bad education, management, and stuff. So I said, if, you're, if, if you could uh, somehow access the education to do this properly, this architecture, uh, and you could get around your stupid manager who won't send you on training courses or allow you to learn, or your universities who don't even bother to teach you, how many people would want to be proper architectural engineers? What I call the other quantified. Everybody raises their hands. Yeah. Oh, okay. How many people here would like to be Real architectural engineers, if they got the training, and yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a thrilling, interesting job. It's actually more fun than programming when you've programmed for 10 or 20 years. You know, you could get bored after a while. I did, to be quite honest. I found other thrilling things, like the challenge of people. Really tricky business. But that's, of course, why you program, because you're avoiding people. 
I don't know. But still, it's an interesting problem. Okay. Now, how are we going to do this? Um, by, uh, I'll show you specific examples, but what we're going to do is sort of hand to developers the following. Uh, your, your new system um, will improve user friendliness for um, the, the, the users using the system so that what they do in 60 minutes now, they can always do in 10 minutes. That's a pretty clear idea. It's going to get six times better, this user friendliness, right? And just hand that over and say, we're not going to tell you or allow the users or salesmen or anybody to tell you how to design that user interface. Because they do it all the time. It's called features and functional requirements from the customer. Amateur design. You are going to figure out exactly what you have to do to get down to 10 minutes. You can, you can dream up any design you like, agree on the team, that looks sexy, let's do it. Try it out, and if it starts moving you down towards 10 minutes, you're right, you don't need any committees or managers or directors or architects to tell you you've got the right design. You've got the design necessary to get you down to 10 minutes. It's all the You get judged on your result, not on whether you can code somebody else's bad ideas. Did you ever feel you were coding somebody else's bad ideas? But, well, you get paid for it, so, you know. Wouldn't you like to code your good ideas instead? This is what this is about, okay? So that's, that's the basic idea. In other words, we, we uh, give a design task, you know, get down to 10 minutes, uh, make sure that 99.9% .9 of all the hackers are detected within 10 seconds, that's secure design. And we literally say, you're smart people, you're as smart as anybody else out there, in fact, probably smarter and more experienced, why don't you figure out how to get there? You know, why let a user tell you they want a password when there are smarter ways of dealing with security? Because the, all the user knows is their pin code on their credit card anyway, they think that's security. Right? <laughs> you know better. Okay. Okay. So now, the moment you step up to the plate and you take this um, challenge of uh, reaching quality, performance, and cost levels, which are numeric, you've entered the world of what I call engineering. Engineering, in, in my terms, is characterized by multi-dimensional problem solving, like ten different qualities, performance, and cost targets simultaneously, and they're all quantified. You know exactly you have to get down to 10 minutes by the 1st of January, okay? And you are empowered now to, to, as a team to design your way there, to code or not code. We have an unconference. What about uncoding? Uh, sometimes as interesting as coding, okay? Uh, and, but measure that whatever you do, you're moving towards your target as a team. I'm going to show you people doing that, okay? And your, your payoff your pride is that you get to the goals. And how you designed it, how you programmed it, is inside the black box and it's nobody's business but yours. Okay, what you have is a much better system. And you designed it. Okay, there's nobody else more qualified to do that. No architect is, gets near the realities of understanding how their things will be. So you can, every week is what we do. We test and measure that our design is actually driving us towards the quality and performance targets we want. Okay, uh, but then, yeah, so in other words, when you're doing that, you are real, you're really engineering the software, okay? And your skills at coding are just one of many trades. Some people will test, right? Some people will motivate the team, <laughs> okay? You're all developers together, have different, different skills. But the, the point is that the skill set of the team goes together to deliver the multidimensional results. And that's where the team wins or loses, as in a ball team, soccer, for example. Yeah. Uh, may not have, let's see, that's not a real proper screen, is it, right? Oh, well. I'm going to give you two case studies to start with, uh, uh, Raytheon and IBM. Here's just for fun, uh, uh, the, the developer who doesn't get a lot of sun and exposure, and then all the other people. I just thought that was... Besides, good excuse for showing pretty ladies in bikinis to a bunch of men who haven't been home for a while, so. Okay. Now, the, the IBM study is called the clean room method. Okay, anybody hear of the clean room method of programming? Just, yeah, no, well, now you did. Actually, there was wrong answer. Everybody should raise their hand because I just now started talking about the clean room method, so you heard of it now. This is arguably one of the first big successful agile methods but it's from the 1970s, long before the Agile Manifesto. And it is much better and more successful than any Agile project using Scrum has ever been. I'll show you, okay? 
So those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it and write bad, agile manifestos when in fact we knew a lot better things before they wrote them. But what can you do with these guys? Okay. <laughs> Now, so clean, you know, the challenge here was um, IBM uh, was in Federal Systems Division, space and military projects, and they have some of the most challenging systems in the world, you know, uh, going where no man has gone before them, space and technology. But they also have a government that says, lowest bidder wins the contract, and tough luck, you're not going to get any more money. And so every time IBM won the contract, lowest bidder, they also lost money on it, trying to deliver the high quality. And they said, there's no point in being in this business because it's not profitable. So they found their resident uh, genius, Harlan Mills, and said, he's sort of like, for me, the Leonardo da Vinci of, of programming. He got people doing six weeks of structured programming classes before they're allowed to code on his team. Think about that for a moment. You ever do six weeks of structured programming classes? Yeah, that's how fanatic he was at the coding level. But um, his idea was, if you're very, very, very disciplined, you will not inject so many defects. Clean room means no bugs in the room. They never get in. <laughs> okay? Our, our mentality today is uh, hack it and, and then leave it to the testers to find and fix, and, and, and fix, and fix the bug cycle, the buggy. That's kind of stupid. The only smart thing is to not eject the defects in the first place. But that may require that you're more disciplined than you are and other quality control tactics, which we'll mention. Okay. Anyway, he, he spent 10 years developing his ideas. And one of the ideas is called uh, iteration and feedback. Okay? In other words, the, the core of what we know today as Agile. Definitely not Big Bang. Uh, if, you, if, if you notice the... Uh, yeah, uh, they're, they're delivering in 45 incremental deliveries once a month for four years. That means delivery to a ship, a, a, a naval system, and they're trying it out with sailors. Okay. Um, now, bottom line for uh, Hardin's methodology was that, uh, for example, the lamp ship they mentioned, uh, if we go back, every one of those deliveries was on time and under budget, 40, 43 in a row. Okay. I mean, nothing about late, ever. Okay. Have you ever been late? Yeah. Yeah. Would you like to meet people who are never late when delivering code? You just met them. Now, there's a reason why they're never late, okay? And delving into it might teach you how to never be late. One, late, like three years late or four years late, is a, one reason for the extremely high level of total project failure. You know, you're just, uh, there's nothing for four years that's failed, at least for those. And sometimes it becomes obsolete, you never deliver it. Um, for a, a mix of projects, which included space shuttle, ground systems, and other things, uh, this period where they're learning, so they haven't mastered everything in the first few years, there are still very few late, i.e. after the deadline in the contract, and overrun means budget or money overrun, okay? In that decade, in 10 years, it's not bad because these are the most difficult projects in the world, full stop, okay? and none at all in the past four years. So once they mastered the methods, there was, if you like, perfect project management. Very high quality in the specs, delivered on time, under budget, every time. How many of you can say, that's what I've been doing? <laughs> every time, no exceptions, perfect project. Yeah, I didn't see any. Well, maybe you've got something to learn here from history. Okay. There's a lot of literature on clean room. But you know, look, Google it right now. Books, papers, the whole lot. I'm just, you know, opening the door to you to figure this one out. Uh, but it's arguably an incredibly good agile method and far superior to things like Scrum, in case you want my opinion. Reason it's far superior to Scrum, uh, a, a clue, they're definitely dealing with multi-dimensional quantified metrics like 99.998% availability and things like that, definitely, okay? So this is not just code and hope and quality, it's just something you get by accident. Um, uh, introduced you to a colleague of Hardin Mills, uh, Robert Quinnen, and he was the specialist in what I call dynamic design to cost. Hmm. How do you get high quality? Do you um, hack things together and then debug? I suspect that's the method, you guys know. Okay. Now, everybody knows you do not get quality by testing it in. Maybe you can finish the sentence, right? You get quality and everything in life by designing it in. 
You think an iPhone is just a debug Nokia telephone? <laughs> what do you think Steve Jobs is doing? He is the designer with great taste and rigor and makes and he works directly with the programming teams on the early Macs and things like that, okay? So uh, he, he has guys like Steve Wozniak to program for him, so good is smart enough to pick a genius programmer. Same time, okay? Now, uh, but long story short, uh, 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 what they do is every cycle, uh, you know, they know that we have a four-year project and every month we're going to deliver some code, basically, okay? Uh, they think they, they can do this and that in a month. Let's call that a sprint, put it in normal terminology. Now, let's say a month goes by and you try and deliver and you do not achieve what you thought you would achieve in a month. So you keep on trucking and three months later, three months delayed, you manage to achieve it. What have you learned? Your estimate's wrong by a factor of four, right? If this continues, our four-year project will take 16 years and be 12 years delayed. Good to get early warning signals. This is known as lean. Solve your problems early, solve them upstream. So what do they do? Quinnen grabs this and says, I'm gonna use my mental energy as a designer and architect, and I'm gonna find a design where we can do this stuff in a month, not four months. I'm going to figure something else that takes less time. I may have to buy something rather than build something. Take a simple example of what you could design to shorten time, right? And they do that. Let's say they try another month that's supposed to take a month, and by God, within three weeks, they've delivered it. They said, whatever we did was a good thing, because continuing in this way, we're going to get the job done on time. That is dynamic design. Dynamic means you're getting feedback all the time, every cycle. How much time did it take? What are you achieving? Uh, are you on track? This is not unlike a burn down stack. It's just, it's a burn down stack for maybe 10 qualities simultaneously being tracked. It's quite different from, you know, did we write the user case, user stories or the code uh, quickly. Uh, so, you know, the velocity of code writing is interesting, but, it, but it's a lot more interesting to deliver stuff that people value, like usability, security, and availability, and to track and manage that. And I'm suggesting the programmers can and should manage that. These people are too, okay? So it's actually a whole new way of dealing with cost. It says, we don't estimate how much the programming will cost and when it will be done. We are told it will be done on 1st of January next year. And we are told the budget's 100 you know, thousand euros or something like that, or hundred million. And so we have to live within our purse, okay? We can't, we have to, be, but we have to, and we don't know right now exactly what to do to live within our purse, but we can find out in 2% increments whether we in fact are living within our purse. And if we are not, we need to bring on the brains, the imagination, really challenging. Can you figure out a way to design it so it's 10 times cheaper? Smart people can crack that problem. I can, I suspect most of you are smart enough to do it. But you have to be challenged. How can we do this in 10, 10 times faster? If we can't, we're gonna be late, we're gonna lose money, we'll never deliver the quality required, okay? This is when it gets fun, you get a problem. I mean, my wife loves Sudoku, but I, I find that totally boring. I like the problem, can you find a design that will be implementable 10 times faster than anybody in this room can figure out? I love those problems. They're so much more fun than Sudoku. <laughs> How many people love Sudoku here? Uh, there are more challenging problems out there. You know, I mean, you know, when a, a computer can just fill it in in an instant, you know, you're you're not exactly contributing to humanity by cracking the problem. And you can still exercise your brains on problems like this. What I think is nice. Okay. So, uh, in other words, the iteration process is trying to meet cost targets by either redesign or sometimes sacrificing lower pr priority things that you don't have to do. Uh, okay, but uh, now th this is, there's uh, quite a lot of written by Quinn and available, and uh, I have, well, you can probably find it by just searching on the internet, but if you need help, well, it's published in IBM System Journal number 4, 1980, in detail, and you will find that web available if you look at it. If you want to get into detail what Quinn did, probably some of the other books. So, design is an iterative process. It's not a one-time thing done by architects up front, if you like. And that's why the programmers have to get involved, because they're involved in the loop. They're able to do stuff the architect can't even do, like write the code and test it and measure it and get the insight. Why have a silly bureaucratic overhead designed for waterfall models called a, an architect? Good question. Yeah. I don't think it's necessary. Okay, more of that. 
Uh, and now I'm going to turn my attention to Raytheon. Uh, Raytheon, uh, it, it, this is Raytheon Space and Missiles, uh, most famous for delivering the software for the Patriot missile, you know, the intelligent missile, as opposed to Saddam Hussein's Scud missiles that shoot and hope. And these home in on the target and shut down the hole on TV and blow up the secret police headquarters kind of stuff. Okay. Now, if you want details, uh, I just picked up, actually, they've, they've uh, a new link. Uh, you have those, a the beautiful paper. It's really worth a study. Uh, but um, going straight to it, I'll just give you an extract of the study. Now, in 1988, and those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it, so I'm the historian here, right, the archaeologist. They discovered that they had about 1,000 programmers, and they discovered that uh, 430 of those programmers were fixing bugs and retesting that they themselves had injected. Now imagine an army of a thousand soldiers, right? And you're just about to go into battle and the general says, how many soldiers do I have? Oh, about 600. I thought I had a thousand. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, 400 have been shot by our own troops and we're busy tending the wounded. <laughs> now, can you imagine a stupider army? I mean, an enemy shooting, that's one problem. But these guys have shot themselves in the foot, meaning they have injected the bugs themselves they have to deal with. Now it turns out there is a theory by uh, Philip Crosby, who's written books like Quality is Free. And it says that this uh, high percentage of rework is initially normal and natural, because nobody's tried to do anything about it. It's just people messing about and being sloppy. But if you put your mind to reducing it systematically, you can get rid of it. It took them eight years, but they got down to 5%. Now, they, they, they started off by analyzing, and by the way, uh, if you don't have a number for this, you probably are at 43%, okay? That's just sort of a normal expectation. Uh, they, there's a theory that say that the reason for this is everybody's doing their own thing in their own inimitable style, and they don't want to be free and creative in programming in any, any language, any way, anything you picked up at the conference, have fun, and that's the basic reason. Now, it turns out there's a thing called best practices, right? And, Ideally, we're picking them up, the very best practices. And if everybody followed the best practice, everything would be a little bit better, because after all, the other guys are following not so best practices. That's what messes them up. So what they did is they pulled out their programming standards handbook. I've seen 60-page versions of these, coding standards, okay? And said, everybody has to follow this standard whether they like it or not, <laughs> pain of death, or something like that. Okay? So the first year, the rework drops to about 27%. Okay, so that's proof that these best practices embedded in the standard are better than anarchy and chaos. In fact, it's the difference between CMM level one, which is anarchy and chaos, and level two, which is a little bit more organized stupidity. Okay, because it's kind of stupid to still have 270 programmers out of action because of the bugs they're still inserting using the so-called best practices for coding, which obviously aren't all that hot, they're just better than the devil, also known as chaos, also known as total creative freedom to be a programmer without any regard to what is really a good idea. <laughs> and we do believe in freedom, right? <laughs> now, uh, at this point, we've got what we call a stable system. This is the same as statistical process control concepts of Deming. It, 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 it says that basically, uh, if we don't change anything, we're going to bump along here at 27% forever. But that's not good enough. We want to get much better. So the, what you have to do is now go into a process improvement style. Okay? D uh, and and they, they use a method called the defect prevention process, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, uh, invented by IBM in 1980, which is quite simply programmers looking at code and requirements and test outputs and saying, is there some kind of fault which is very frequent and has a common cause? You know, like nobody got trained in how to do this properly. And if so, can we just train them properly so they won't spout out a thousand new defects every day? Okay, in other words, you, by getting to the common cause, the root cause, it's much cheaper to do that than to fix the thousand bucks that are injected every day. Much cheaper, like, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 to one cheaper. So that's the only smart thing to do. That's the basic uh, idea. So they start on that process, and from the, uh, from the uh, 
uh, first year, and they start measuring the reduction of defect uh, of, of rework. And it goes down, and as they improve the process, they get proof of concept by saying we have more and more programmers freed up to do useful work, less and less rework. Okay? That's proof that they're doing something good to their programming environment. The uh, little peak there where it says best process change, there was, uh, they didn't say what that was in the paper, but I was holding a lecture on this in Washington, D.C., and uh, somebody said, what's that peak? And I said, well, that could be maybe when they merged a thousand new programmers into the organization. <laughs> That's a good theory. But one lady said, no, Tom, I was there, and I can tell you that was a bad process change, a good idea that didn't work very well, but we measured it and yanked it out. Okay, so they have total, you know, they, they are, what they're doing is they're, in this case, the programmers are designing their own environments. Really, this is not an elite consultancy or cute quality director. The defect prevention process is uh, grassroots programmers looking at their own coding and other problems and deciding how to solve them themselves. And that works better than any form of consultant or director or anything else. Okay, so this is designing your own working environment, your own programming environment. It's, it's the only thing that works well, too. All other methods, you know, the outside consultant that gets a fortune for telling the management to do lean or agile, total waste of time, every time. But uh, we pay a lot until we recognize it, then we refuse to admit that we were stupid enough to pay all that money for nothing, okay? Okay, enough of that. Uh, by the way, little side effects. Uh, this chart simply means with 26 uh, project data that they tripled the productivity of the programmers. That's partly a result, sorry, that's partly a result of removing the waste and partly a result of putting in more powerful things that live better. So in other words, 100 people can now uh, do the work of 270. That's powerful. Would you like to triple your productivity and with a corresponding pay raise, of course? <laughs> yeah, why not? It's possible, people do it for 1,000 people. Here's another thing, uh, when they started off, they were pretty good because they only ran over budget by 40%. NASA runs over budget average 100, 150% we have data for. But they're a little bit looser. This is a commercial organization, NASA gets government money, so they can afford to be looser. But uh, you know, within the first year, they suddenly found all their projects, this is 26 project data, delivered at budget, okay? How many people have a situation where all projects done to a certain budget were delivered at or under budget for four years in a row? Did you hear my question? <laughs> How many people can raise their hands? Just I repeat, how many people can raise their hand? I just have to, okay, good, no, that works. So how many people always get it done cheaper than the budget? Okay, <laughs> made my point, right? Um, here are some examples of the process improvements. There, you know, there are lots and lots of them, but you know, they're the usual things: uh, bad interfaces, uh, t you know, test repeatability, uh, bad quality control inspection on things like code and test cases and and requirements, and uh, you know, late requirements update, mucking everything up and stuff like that and unplanned growth of functionality. So these are all the usual problems that screw people up. Point is, they identified these things as root causes of bad programming productivity. They improved or changed the system and measured that the system was indeed really improved, move on. That's what's going on there. Okay. And the suggestions for what to do in the doing it is largely decentralized to the troops. There is no management consultancy advising top management of what to do here at all. Okay, that's the important point about the whole talk. Um, the uh, bugginess went down by a factor of three. It's kind of nice. The, now, here's the interesting one, which wouldn't interest programmers, but it, it interested this team. At a very early stage, they calculated how much money they were spending on training people to do this and doing it and all that kind of stuff. And uh, they, uh, then they took a look at how much they were saving or improving things economically. And they figured out for every dollar spent, they were getting a payback of $7.70. That is 770% return on investment. Let's see, how much do Romanian banks pay for your savings now? 2%? Three, four, three, three. Three, wow. Yeah, see? So, you know, so that's just chicken feed compared to 770%. So this is like the smartest, 
This, what they did is they said, we went to our chief financial officer who's handing out money for improvement in the corporation. And our colleagues went and said, you know, please, sir, can we have some more budget for improving things? We went and said, uh, if you give us a dollar, we'll give you $7.70 back. They got all the money going, the whole corporation. You gotta have a good argument. These guys are bean counters, right? They don't know bugs and bits and bites and all that shit, but they sure as hell know a good investment when this put in front of their... Yeah? So, you, you know, if you, if you want money to have fun as geeks, you have to convince the guys with the money that you're worth it. As the Estelle Lauder slogan says, are you worth it? Yeah? Okay, that's the defect prevention process. Mapped, it's a you know teachable discipline, half a day or a day or something like that. And uh, we didn't go into it. There's, there's literature on it. Okay, uh, I think I've summarized that. Uh, looking at watches might be useful. Okay, now, we're shifting over to IBM here. In about not early 1970s, uh, Michael Fagan and Ron Radis. Uh, Fagan is mainly famous for having invented the software inspection method. I wrote a 500-page book on the subject, still in print. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and Ron Radis is not famous for having invented it, but it really did. But Fagan stole the credit being a manager. So, <laughs> But Radis went on to invent the capability maturity model at IBM. And uh, uh, now, the idea of inspection originally was, was clearly laid out in the early literature. We're going, to in, we're going to find bugs in code and problems with test planning and requirements and design. Half of all bugs come from bad inputs to programmers, not bad programming, in case you don't know. In other words, requirements and design, if they're unclear, directly lead to bugs that the programmer can't do much about. But the programmer gets the blame because it's in the program. But why should you take blame? I mean, you know, refuse entry to bad stuff. Garbage in should not result in garbage out in the code. But that's what you're getting the heat for there. Anyway, uh, their theory was we do inspection, we find stuff, but the most important thing we do is not to clean up the, the defects we find, because you can only find about 30% of what's there using these methods. Any form of test or inspection will only find you 30 to 50% of all the bugs that are actually there. So cleaning up isn't very effective. I mean, you know, if you have 1,000 bugs and you clean up 300, you still have 700 left. And there's nothing you can do with testing or inspection about that. So they, they had a bigger plot. They'd learned it from, uh, you know, Deming and Duran and these quality control gurus. And they said the big plot is to figure out through the statistics we gather the frequent um, causes of bugs with common causes, meaning you can fix one thing and it fix everything, and then we will uh, we will prevent the defects from being ejected because we'll have better information to the programmers, better training, and all that stuff. That failed, and looking back, we know why it failed. Uh, uh, Fagan had a very arrogant attitude. He always say, "I am not a programmer. I am a manager." And that's a big deal. That I'd be a manager. Programmer had no status. Okay. And when I asked him what he thought about uh, why they had failed to do this and somebody else, so I'll introduce him what was doing it better, he, he you know, uh, I said, what do you think about a process which decentralizes this work of um, improving the, 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 the whole scene through the, with the programmers? He just said, I think managers ought to manage. He would, you know, he just, the idea of delegation to coders was not part of his culture. But he failed. That's the good news. Arrogant, top-down managers fail. Okay? Along comes... Robert Mays and Carol Jones at Research Triangle Park in IBM and say they had a new theory. The theory was that managers were never going to solve this problem. They hadn't done it in 10 years. What about giving the programmers a chance? <laughs> and so they delegated the analysis of the bugs and their root causes and what should we do about it literally to the programmers. And guess what? <laughs> I just showed you Raytheon. They used that defect prevention method to drive the defects down and make everything better. It worked. Why did it work? Several things. Uh, see, managers only come up with one great big idea, which they paid a very expensive consultancy to help them with called lean or something like that. And of course, it never works. Maybe the idea is good, but they never implement it decently anyway. But they paid this consultant. There was a big idea that'll take five years to implement, nothing will happen. And by that time, they were taking a new job elsewhere, so they couldn't care less, okay? <laughs> Programmers care, because they suffer every day from the bugs and the problems. And uh, it's, it's kind of a fun new job to be asked, would you analyze why we have this bug? Would you like to suggest what we should do so a thousand programmers don't commit this bug every day? 
Would you like to implement it and take the honor for having saved us from a thousand bucks? That's the new de deployment to the programmers. We're empowering the programmers to analyze their own working environment and to come up with improvements, not through an outside consultant, themselves. And often we, if, if possible, in small, certainly smaller organizations, we let them implement it themselves and measure whether they're successful or not. So this is real, you know, grassroots democracy rather than elitist management. And that worked. Um, but one source of uh, information on this is in our book, uh, chapter 7 and 17. Okay? But there, you, know, you can get free digital stuff about this. Uh, if you went to Robert Mays and Carol Jones uh, right now on Google, you probably find the, the uh, basic write-ups of the method. Here's another customer of mine, uh, customer of mine uh, Dick Holland. He started deploying these from 1995. And uh, we, just for fun, using the experiences we had like at Raytheon and other places, uh, he had a terrible bug situation, just about to destroy his company, put it in simple terms. And we projected that we could reduce the major defects and the minor defects over a five-year period by yay much. And actually carried it out and was ahead of the curve. Okay, but using defect prevention process, inspection, and uh, other tools that we taught. And there's a whole wonderful little uh, 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 agent of change case study on my website if you want to look at the details of that. Okay, to another client, this is uh, 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 McDonnell Douglas, uh, later bought up by Boeing, and we later did exactly this at the larger uh, Boeing Corporation. So um, what we did is we taught them to do this inspection on engineering drawings for aircraft. Forget IT, forget programming. <laughs> but we have 3,000 engineers who are injecting defects that look just like the kind of stuff that programmers do. You know, a little slip of the pen, a little lack of focus, wrong thing identified. And I said, I think we can crack that problem using the same inspection method. And what we did is we, we, we then set what we call an exit level. Exit level is release level, okay? Now, if you have, let's say you have a page of code, you know there are 100 bugs in it. Good idea to release it? Probably a bad idea, right? Uh, now, zero would be a very good idea, but maybe very difficult to achieve. Friend Gerald Weinberg uh, loves the rhetorical question, when you think you've killed the last bug off, how many more remain? Answer, always at least one more. If you ever think you got them all, you're arrogant, you're foolish, and you're gonna find a new bug, okay? So, uh, what we're, we're doing here, this is a, one particular person who actually took over some of the training later called Gary. But he said, uh, uh, initially, when I uh, submitted my drawings and we used Gilb's inspection method, we found 80 major defects. These are just violations of best practice. You know, unclear, bad stuff, doesn't matter. Uh, they'd always been doing that, and, and this was causing them to actually have late, delayed manufacture of aircraft and stuff like that, ultimately. But we'd set a new standard. They had no standard. We said, no more than one major defect per drawing, maximum, before we release. So Gary got the message, you are 80 times worse than our standard. We do this with code too, all the time, and requirements. And he said, but I've been just doing what I've always been doing, and everybody's always accepted it, say, yeah, and we're going bankrupt too, with the practice. So we've got to stop something here. So uh, uh, he, he went back to his drawing board, quite literally, and tried again, and uh, they took a look at it, and he only had 40 defects. What's happened is he's learned how to be twice as good. <laughs> He's learned what the rules of best practice are and how to do them in practice. Well, 40 is a lot better than 80, but it isn't as good as one. It's still 40 times worse. So this cycle continues because Gary's going through a learning curve of what the best practices are and how to practice them. And after about four or five cycles, uh, he turns in something that, in fact, had zero defects found, but uh, is under one major defect. At that point, the drawing is released and it's 80 times better than the normal practice. So this leads, this actually saved the company, you can say in simple terms. Okay, here are just some quotes. But the, the point is, the measurement of the defects in any kind of technical specification, requirements, testing, coding, um, uh, is used to motivate people to not have such bad measures and to meet a certain standard, like no more than one, when they're normally up there at 100 or more. Okay, and that, that gets people actually doing good best practices, long story short. Okay, um, 
Can I, can I, can I, can I do uh, here, Here's some of the experience. Uh, that, that, uh, this is like a four-year time frame, and we're looking at uh, practice at IBM and NASA, uh, mainly. The, the first curve is the defect prevention curve. Everything under that curve are bugs that normally happened statistically, but now they don't. They simply not happened at all. So you don't have to find them, you don't have to fix them, you don't have to retest them. This is a beautiful world. And as people get better and better at the practice, uh, you get up to order of magnitude over 99% defect prevention. That's like at NASA, six years of hard work, very professional. But the vast majority of bugs injected can be not injected. And that's the world we want to get to. Now, unfortunately, we, we cannot and do not prevent absolutely all. So there's a second line of defense here, a second mode around the castle called inspection. And this is, uh, called, this is also called static testing. But this is when programmers eyeball the code and say, ah, I found a bug, before it's executed, before it gets into the system. Now the advantage there is largely that it's 10 times cheaper to repair. It saves a lot of time and money, okay? But unfortunately, uh, inspection isn't perfect either, although it can be systematically improved. So you still have to have a thing called testing. And testing will take the stuff that has neither been prevented nor detected early. But now it's detected late. There's a cost, but hopefully there are very few. And in simple terms, what isn't found by testing, of course, gets uh, released to the users as a feature. Isn't that what happens? <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's some of the experience data from uh, IBM. The main thing uh, I, I, I like here is that at, um, in IBM in Minnesota, which I visited, they're like the most competent IBM lab. Uh, rated by their own organization, um, they had, uh, in, in a 10-year period, they had 1,822 suggested and uh, uh, things in, let's see, in, between, uh, sorry, December 91 and May 93, they had 2,162 actions implemented. That means changes to the programmer's working environment and training and information. That's not one big idea for managers like Lean. That is 2,162 improvements suggested by programmers for programmers. By the way, nobody, no programmer suggests something they wouldn't love to do, like sleep a little bit later, or have whiskey on tap, or whatever it is. Okay? So in other words, managers are forever suggesting things that programmers will hate and, 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 uh, sub, uh, and kill off if they can. But programmers only suggest stuff that will make them better, and they will enjoy it, okay? So there's a, another practical reason for delegating the power to the programmers is they will not waste time suggesting things that they will hate. It's not gonna happen, okay? Very crude, but managers will invariably do that, it, it turns out. Okay, so, uh, scorecard, managers zero, historically, and devs one, okay? We win. Uh, gee, time flies. I've got so much more I wanted to say, but uh, next time they'll give me two hours, right? <laughs> Halfway through. Uh, let's see, uh, in the interest of maybe giving you some highlights, but maybe over, maybe you, know, you just need to go out and take your break now. I can only overwhelm you more with more stuff too fast. But I, I'll, I'll skip through, I'll just make some comments that'll allow you maybe to uh, see what I would have talked about if I'd had more time to talk about it. Okay, my, I just made up this whole thing yesterday, so I haven't quite got the timing down, but it's clearly a two-hour job. Uh, <laughs> um, here's my, our favorite client called Confirmit, and uh, they, there's the programming team right there, a lot of blue chip clients. Um, long story short, we convinced them to give up their stack of changes and fixes, 1,500, forever. The next, they never went back to it, and instead have their top 10 quantified critical objectives, 10 of which were for usability, like better intuitiveness, right? And these numbers are then uh, you know, written up like this in my planning language language, where we quantify them, we put a number on them, you know, like 10 minutes for the user to do something. And uh, uh, here is the uh, uh, way of controlling the projects. In the middle, you have the requirements, which at the right-hand side where it says goal has the numeric goal, like the 10 minutes to do something. On the um, uh, right-hand side is design, where recoding is suggested as a design, which will help us reduce, um, let's see, no, too late, but I uh, can get in there. Right? But anyway, what they're trying to do is reduce, uh, improve productivity from 65 minutes down towards the bottom there, down to 25 minutes. 
And somebody says, if we do, this is a stand-up meeting, a stand-up design meeting with programmers. Okay, and they're saying, we need to get down to 25 minutes. Anybody got any good ideas? And there were 10 or 12 ideas put on the table, but every one of them did what we call impact estimation. Okay, you got a hot idea, but how many minutes are we going to say, that's the point. So one guy says, 20 minutes. That's the 20 down there on the bottom right. Okay? Which is 50% of the way to the goal, between 65 and 25 minutes. We're down to 45 minutes, right? So they decide that they don't have any better ideas and no more time to do anything. So the team then says, let's go for it. This is a one half hour design meeting on your feet. Let's go for it. But this is their own ideas with their own estimation and we're trusting our you know, good people who say 20 minutes that you know, you, know, you, you don't mess about, that's probably as good an estimate as any. So the team commits to going for it. They did in a four day cycle and they handed over the integrated code to Microsoft Usability Labs who had agreed to test all their usability things overnight. This is going from Oslo, Norway to Washington, DC. And uh, the, Microsoft said, you saved 38 minutes. That's the 38 down here. In other words, the design was twice as good as you thought it was. <laughs> that probably doesn't happen that often. We're usually over optimistic, but it happened in this real case. Okay. Um, take a look at this column here where it says percentage improvement. They have, they have to release their software to the world every quarter of a year. A given. They're given 12 weekly sprints. We didn't call them sprints, we called them evolutionary value delivery cycles. <laughs> Evo cycles. But, uh, okay. Now take a look at the numbers. That's the cumulative delivery. So they've used 70, this is like a burn down chart, except it's a burn down chart for multi-dimensional qualities. A team of four programmers has undertaken this set of things, the, four, the 60 people I showed you. If you take the average of all the numbers there, 100% means we got all the way to the goal. Zero means we didn't do a damn thing. They are clearly, they're something like 91.8% uh, or something like that. So they, they, this roughly, they got 90% of the value delivered in 75% of the time. They're ahead of the curve. Even if they were forced to stop now and take three weeks vacation, it still looked very good. <laughs> but they're going to use the rest of the three weeks to target the zero stuff and see if they can kill it off in a week. Again, it's the programmers choose which target, then they choose which design, then they code it, then they test their own stuff, then they maybe get it independently measured, and then they learn whether their designs did or did not work. But at all times, they have a scoreboard, the cumulative score, telling them whether they're on track to the ideal, which is delivering 100% of everything within their six, uh, sorry, uh, three, month three month cycle. And they do it. And almost all the programmers manage to deliver almost all the goals almost all the time, and they've been doing this now for 11 years every week. Okay? This is, this is a radical revolution of how to do programming and design and project management, okay? And it, it did not come from America, where all the bad ideas come from. <laughs> I escaped at a young age, so I can't, okay. It came from a part of Europe called Norway. It's a really smart engineer, so I just showed you a picture of, there's our hero, Trond Johansson. People you could visit and talk with, or maybe get to come to your conference sometime and talk about it. Okay. Now, uh, Having done that, and there's a lot of other stuff I'd like to do, I'm going to say, well, uh, uh, I hope this is interesting enough you might even want to find out what I didn't have time to talk about. <laughs> Plenty of literature on the subject. But uh, main idea is very simple. Uh, experience says that delegating power to developers to do design and checking their own design uh, towards targets which are uh, what the user and marketing people want targets, we don't determine them, is, uh, and then doing this iteratively and learning as you go is the smartest way to get incredible uh, quality. If I were to skip through, here are some of the five top results they actually got out of the 25. Uh, and you can see they are sensationally much better in a quarter of a year. They have 25 of these. Okay. This organization was so successful that they got all the business in the business area and then uh, their competitors started going out of business since they got no business, since these guys had better quality, so they bought up their competitors. They wiped the floor clean with their competitors. That's why my book is called Competitive Engineering. 
It's vicious. <laughs> Delivers quality that puts the slower guys out of business. Thank you. I'm going to go to the last slide, <laughs> which is a free offer. But you have to be hungry for knowledge because this isn't easy. You want easy stuff, get some papers off of the website. But if you'd like the Bible or textbook of how to you know, be a hundred times more powerful, you better study this one. I'll give you a free copy. Thank you. Thank you.